In this video, we'll write a node that uses transforms from the TF system. This demo uses the same TF packages that we added as dependencies in the previous video, so we don't need to add any new dependencies this time. Let's jump right into the code. And here we've got another simple node that creates a timer to call a callback in which we'll interact with the TF system. To get access to the TF utilities, we're importing the transform listener header and the TF2 geometry messages header. We've added two TF objects as members to our class, a buffer and a listener. The TF buffer is the object that actually tracks our TF tree. It keeps track of what frames are available, what transforms exist between frames, and how that tree changes over time. It will maintain some short history of the tree, and that becomes the range of time we're able to query it for. The TF listener is just an object that starts its own thread and runs in the background. The listener is the object that's subscribing to all of the ROS topics and updating the buffer with the messages that come across those topics. So while we need to create the listener and keep it alive for as long as we want to get updates to our TF tree, we'll only actually be interacting directly with the TF buffer when it comes time to look up transforms. To initialize the buffer, we give it a handle to the ROS clock that we're using, and to initialize the listener, we just give it a reference to the buffer object. Further down, we can see our timer callback, which is where our node will actually do something. The first thing we're doing is checking if we can actually look up the transform that we're interested in. In this case, we're going to be looking up the parent and child relationship that was broadcast by the TF broadcaster in the last video. To check if we have all the parts of the tree we need to connect parent and child, we call the can transform function on the TF buffer. In addition to the source and target frames, we need to give it a time point. In this case, we're giving it time point zero, which tells TF that we just want whatever the latest information available is. If that function returns false, indicating that the transform doesn't exist, we'll log an error once so that we're not spamming the console, and then just return from this timer callback. With this check and this timer callback, our node will now wait until the TF data it's interested in has actually become available. Once the data is available, we'll be able to move past this if statement, and we've got two different functions here that demonstrate different ways to use the transform data from the TF buffer. In the first function, print transform, we're going to look up the actual transform offsets between our two frames and print those out to the console. To get the transform data, we use the function lookup transform on the TF buffer. Again, we need to give it the source, target, and time point that we're interested in. This will return a geometry messages transform stamped message object. We're then building up a formatted representation of that message's contents. So we get the X, Y, and Z of the translation components, and then we convert the rotation quaternion into roll pitch yaw and add that to our formatted output. Then we're just logging that formatted string. In real code, we might be pulling, say, the robot's position from the X and Y values of this transform data, or converting this into a transform matrix either in Eigen or in the TF2 library and using it in some other math. There's another common way to use the transform data from TF, and that's simply to take a sensor measurement or a pose in one frame and convert it to being relative to another frame. To do this, we use the transform function on TF buffer. This function takes in a stamped version of the data we're wishing to convert, and then the target frame we want to convert it to. It'll then return that data transformed into the target frame. By stamped, we mean that this message has a standard header object in it, which includes the frame ID. This will be used as the source frame for the transform function. So in this case, we're creating a point that is one meter away on the x-axis from the child frame location. We're then asking the buffer to transform that into the parent frame location. And then we print the x, y, and z coordinates of that point to the console. And these are the three functions that you'll be using the most often with the TF buffer. You'll always start with a can transform to make sure that the data you're looking for is available. If you skip this step, it'll start throwing exceptions later on, which you can catch, but it's just easier to deal with that ahead of time. Then you'll either use lookup transform or just transform to either get the actual transformation data or convert some sensor data that you have into a different frame. And that's all it takes to get transform data from the TF system. It's nice that the code is as simple as it is because there's still plenty of room to get confused on the math and directionality of these transforms. 
A very common mistake is swapping the source and target frames when you're calling lookup transform, for example. There are cases where that will almost look like it works until you start getting deeper into your testing and then things will just be backwards in weird ways. So that's the code for our listener. Once we've added that to our build file and built our workspace, we can demonstrate this new node by running our listener node and broadcaster node at the same time. And in the listener node, we see the outputs reflecting the transform data being sent by the broadcaster node. And that's all we'll cover for TF. Adding TF listeners to our nodes is very common, since many robotics tasks need to know where the robot is or need to know where a sensor or actuator is. Getting familiar with the TF buffer interface and the other TF2 packages that provide interoperability with other libraries and message types is going to be really helpful when you're writing ROS code.